Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Brad. I'm one of the pastors here at Copper Hills, and I'm glad to welcome you this morning, especially family and friends of our two girls that were baptized. Welcome here. So glad to share this morning with you. To our church family at home, welcome. Trust you're having a great Sunday or whenever you're watching this through the week. We miss you. We tell you that every week, but we do. We'd love to have you back and experience in-person fellowship. There's nothing like it. So uh, come on back. But baptisms are so cool, aren't they? You know, I was thinking this week, four young people are getting baptized. They've gone public in front of the whole world to say they know what Jesus has done for them and only he could do that for them. And I'm thinking some of us came to that realization way later in life. And we look at them with some envy. And we go, man, I wish I'd made that decision earlier. I wish I had experienced what I experienced today way back when I was a little kid like they are. Because they would have their whole life, their whole life to live with Jesus and enjoy the wonder of who he is in everyday life. So the four of you, way to go. That's so fantastic. And, uh, you know, sometimes our children lead us as adults. And it could just be that you watch that and go, that's not just like a, a student thing. That's for me. I've never been baptized. I've never gone public with what Jesus has done for me. Or it happened when I was a little kid, and I didn't really understand it. Maybe my parents encouraged or coerced me to have that done. And I really would like to have that privilege of standing in front of the world and declaring who I live for. Well, we want to give you that opportunity. We're going to do another baptism May the 15th. And if you'd be interested in finding out information about that, you can contact our church office, chc at copperhills.org, and we'll be sure to get back to you. Uh, one other thing I want to uh, share with you before we talk about the Bible lesson for today. Uh, we all are aware of what's happening in Eastern Europe, in the Ukraine, and the horrible horrible loss of, of life and just the tragedy of what is happening there. We've been looking over the last several weeks for a way to help and support, but in a way that our support would go directly to the need. Sometimes when you give to organizations, they take a percentage for their administrative costs, and that makes sense. But we wanted every penny to go directly to helping people in that area. So uh, you may know if you've been around Copper Hills for a period of time that we've been helping a church in Romania. Bastrita, Romania. And uh, a family from our church left here to go there three years ago to help with the church two years ago, I guess it is. And uh, so I contacted them this week and said, what's happening? Are you involved? Are you, what's going on? He says, oh man, are we ever? We have somebody right at the Romanian-Ukraine border uh, trying to help refugees as they come across the line to find shelter and housing and food. And uh, we invite them back to our community if that's where we can help them. And uh, they're just actively involved in it. I said, well, do you have the resources to do that? I said, we're using everything we can, everything we have right now to do that. I said, how could we help? He said, if you're serious about asking, he said, we could use $20,000 right today to help people. And so I just said, I'm going to throw that out to our church family and see if we want to help with that. It's up to you if you feel compelled to do that. If you do, you can go to our website. There's a Ukrainian relief button on our website. Or at home, you can do the same thing. And you can give electronically if you want to drop a check off here at the church. I assure you, every dollar will go to help people from the Ukraine find safety in a new land. Yes, Jesus, our hearts break for what's happening there. Cannot imagine what you must feel. Jesus, would you empower your church at this time? Would they be a light for you? Would they be mistaken for you? in a world where there's a huge price to stand for you these days? Would you help them in the middle of the conflict and the hate and the war and the ugliness of this to be courageous and to be bold? May we who live in peace and rest and resources, may we be lavish in our prayers. May we be lavish in our gifts, Jesus. This is a moment for your church here and there and around the world to rise up and be counted for you, Jesus. And then, would you bring peace to that land? Would you invade the thinking of those that are perpetrating this? Would you stop them? And would you bring peace, Jesus, for the sake of your great name 
and for the sake of the people there. We'll continue to ask you humbly, Jesus. You always know what's best. Thank you. Amen. Okay, so if we can change gears a little bit, I'd like to pick up kind of the next installment of this series we started last week on uh, drift. Actually, the better term would be drift indicators. Uh, And we took it from this single verse in Hebrews, and then we're building off of it to see what Jesus might teach us here. This is from Hebrews 2, chapter 1. It says, We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. If uh, there's a therefore in the Bible, you always should ask, what's it therefore, right? And so the answer is, be careful, therefore, to what we've heard. Well, what Paul, probably the writer of this, has just spent a whole chapter is explaining the supremacy of, God, of Jesus, the exact representation of God on earth. You want to see what God looks like? Look at Jesus. And he just extols the virtues and the wonder and the power and the significance, the supremacy of who Jesus is. And then he starts chapter 2, and it's like he says, listen, 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 whoa, 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 listen. If you ever, ever forget the supremacy of Christ, if you ever lose track of that, if you ever drift away from that, and that seems incidental or inconsequential, you will drift away. So stay close to him. You don't drift to, to Jesus. You drift away from him. You make a decision. So make the decision in your daily life and what you do to carve out consistent time to just be with him and know him. It helps keep you from drifting. However, we all drift, don't we? But what we often don't think about is there are indicators that we're drifting, and we just keep drifting. And then we go off the side of the road, or we have a head-on collision, just like when we ignore the drift indicators on the highways, right? So you, you know what drift indicators are. They're these things right here. They're indentations or bumps on the road, either on the perimeter of the road or the center line, The thinking being that if you kind of lose your way, you start to drift, you drift over these and they're audible and tactile warnings, get back in your lane. If you don't get back in your lane, you're headed over the cliff or you're going to go across the center line right smack into somebody else and you don't want that. We all know that, right? Those are drift indicators. Well, we know about these in other areas of life. We know about it relationally. Like this morning, you might have showed up on campus and you saw someone you have a bit of a difference with and you don't look at them. That's a drift indicator. It indicates there's something wrong in the relationship, right? You get a text saying that your checking account's overdrawn. Indicator, you got a problem, right? Or, uh, you know, in, in other, like your, your, your chest starts to like compress and you have uh, shooting pains down your left arm and you're, you, know, you, you feel this weight and pain in your chest. It's not the bean dip. There's something else going on. It's a warning, right? We know these things in life. But we've been thinking recently, there just might be some spiritual drift indicators as well that may be hard to recognize, maybe even ignored at times. Maybe we just don't see what they are, but if we ignore them, we might just crash and burn spiritually. And I think what... The writer of Hebrews is saying, listen, listen carefully, look for, do an inventory of what are your spiritual drift indicators. Well, what are they? Well, they're things like, possibly, uh, being easily offended. Somebody makes some silly comment about the way you look or how you've done something, and instantly there's something that goes off and go, I'm ticked off at you, right? It just happens really quickly. It happens regularly. It's a habit. It's a drift indicator. Or it could be, there are reoccurring lustful thoughts, and you don't maybe act on them, or if you ignore them, maybe you do. They're, they're drift indicators. When it's hard to forgive for the simplest little things that happen to us, and we hold a grudge, or we tell someone else about what so-and-so did, drift indicators, spiritual drift indicators, they're dangerous, because not recognized, there's no way to do a lane correction and get back into that lane, and we may ultimately drift to really bad places. Do you know that Jesus talks about drift indicators? He does so in his most famous talk. I think it's, to me, it's the most famous talk. It's the most profound 
piece of writing to me in all of Scripture. It's the day that a whole group of people, thousands of people apparently, are gathered on the side of a hill in northern Israel around the Sea of Galilee. And early on in Jesus' public ministry, he stands in front of them and he shares with them the idea of what life in his kingdom would look like, the place where he gets his way. And then he goes on to describe the unlikely people that can be part of his kingdom, the people that are rejected in culture, the marginalized, the demeaned. You, in my kingdom, can exist and have life to the full here. And then he goes on and he begins to explain a whole series of drift indicators that indicate that you just might be drifting out of the kingdom or out of the presence or out of awareness of Jesus' presence. And this really concerns Jesus. It matters to him. Because what he wants is he wants to give life to the full. He wants to do intimate, everyday, moment-by-moment life. And he's so kind that he tells us straight up what those, some of those drift indicators are. And it's interesting to me where he starts is the first one. I don't think it's happenstance. I don't think he was musing on the hillside, what do I talk about first? Um, oh, this. No, I think he was intentional to start here because where he starts, if you look at the other drift indicators, they actually, most of them start right here with this one. So what is it, right? Right. This is what it is. Matthew 5. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. Great, end of the lesson. We all got that one, probably. No, this is what he says. But I tell you that anyone who's angry, there it is, can circle that one, underline it, highlight it. That's what he's going to talk about. But I tell you, anyone who's angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, anytime you see a therefore, you want to ask what it's there for. Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there remember your brother or sister has something against you, not you against them, he'll deal with that in Matthew 18, but has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them, then come back and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you're still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Surely, I tell you, you'll not get out until you have paid the last penny. So Jesus starts off a whole series of Drift indicators when it comes to making oaths and about loving enemies. But he starts with anger. Why is that? Well, anger in itself isn't, isn't bad. It's just that it leads to angry feelings or is prompted by angry feelings. Which left unchecked, if you're driving over those rumble strips and left unchecked, leads to condemnation of people. And if that's left unchecked, it leads to demeaning them verbally in other ways. See, to be angry at someone with angry feelings, you're actually saying in a way, you hurt me, I hope you hurt. And if that isn't enough, you nurse that long enough, you go, you know something, you're not worthy. You're not worthy of being forgiven. You're not worthy of having life. You're not worthy. And if that goes far enough, you actually demean them and hope they get something really bad happening in their lives. But Jesus is saying it doesn't start there. It doesn't start with murder, but in the end it ends up that way. There's a diminishing thing that happens here when we experience anger, and it isn't just prompted by injustice and so on. It's actually in, in a response, an emotional response within us that causes us to think badly of the other person. Now, you might say, well, that's a really, that's a really low bar. <laughs> like, when doesn't that happen? Like, Jesus gets angry, right? Remember that? There's a story of he sees people making a mockery of what 
the sacredness of the temple courtyard. And he takes a whip and overturns the tables of the bankers in the place. It's not bad to do that to bankers, by the way. That's okay. But he, he evidently is angry, right? Here, I would say to this. Jesus has a level of character that I can trust him with stuff I can't trust myself with. See, I think Jesus can do that without the angry feelings inside of doing it. It's unique. Some would say, well, hold it. Shouldn't we be angry at injustice? Shouldn't we be angry at things when they're, they're just way over the line, immoral and wrong? Yeah. But we shouldn't deal with them with angry feelings inside of us. It prevents us from actually dealing with it well. You know what else it does? Anger expressed in that way creates angry responses, which create angry responses, which create condemnation. You see, I think this. I think you can get everything that you can get with anger without the anger. I think you can. And I think that's maybe what Jesus is speaking about here. That may be what he's addressing. But our reality is, we are really quick to respond to the emotion we feel, and it trips up our logic, and we jump to angry feelings. At least I do. So I'll be a case study this morning, okay? A couple of weeks ago, I went to Fry's to go grocery shopping. My first mistake, right? But I go grocery shopping, pick up a few items, and I pull into this massive parking lot, and uh, I'm coming up one of the aisles, and I see someone get into their car, put the brake lights on, reverse lights come on, and they're about to back up. I put my turn signal on. No problem. I pull. I'm back far enough. They can just back and take off. And then I notice there's another vehicle coming this way, and they stop as well. They did not have their turn signal on, okay? <laughs> Let's be clear, okay? So the car backs out, pulls away. I zip into the spot. Created a problem. That gentleman was not happy who was, thought it was his parking spot. My parking spot. I was there. There's parking spot etiquette. Did you know that? First one in with their turn signal on gets the spot. Right? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. You can applaud for that. Okay. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. He was angry at me, and my response was, hey, no problem. I'll just back out. And you can drive in. Not a chance. <laughs> There's something that went off in me. That went, you, you, like, I, I didn't do that intentionally. It was my turn. It was my spot. I waited. I had my turn signal on. I'm justifying myself because anger, we're always right. Anger comes out of I'm right. And I was. <laughs> but here's what happened. The his response of honking his horn, yeah, that's right, his response of honking his horn and rolling down his window and using hand gestures to tell me he loves me <laughs> crossed my will because I had just crossed his will and we didn't know each other's will were being crossed. We just knew what each other wanted. And so anger started to grow. My response was anger toward him. And guess what his response back was? More anger. Now he used some choice words. Why is it when we're angry, we use words that deal with private body parts and <laughs> body emissions and sens sensitive areas? <laughs> because we want to demean people. It's what, it's what anger does for us. Bottom line, do you know what I think Jesus is teaching here? I think Jesus is teaching anger isn't wrong. It's unnecessary. Can I give you an example? Casseroles aren't wrong. They're just unnecessary. <laughs> totally unnecessary. <laughs> no, I think that's what he's saying. I think he's turning to people who are saying, look, 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 what have you accomplished with anger, like angry feelings, that if you had ratcheted those back and felt 
the rumble strips and heard them going off and rather than just keep going, had pulled back and said, Jesus, I think I'm on my road to anger and condemnation and diminishing someone. And you've never done that to me. And I will not do that here. Would you help me? Would you help me do that? I think that's what he's pointing to. Now, is that easy? No. But it might, in some of our lives, break a habit of anger. Where the first thing we do, we've trained ourselves emotionally. That's the first place we go. And Jesus would want to help and go, you won't like where that leads you. It never leads you to the right, healthy, wholesome place. So let me help you over here. Get you back in the lane and live that way. Jesus is the smartest person who's ever lived. And he understands real life in real terms, in real ways. You can just see it unfold in this passage. I want to take you through it really quickly. Where he says, I, I think anger, it can become something more. And then that can become something more. And it really is really destructive. Watch what he does here. He says, but I tell you that anyone who's angry with a brother or sister, okay, just kind of, kind of two people ticked off. They're angry with each other. Now, if it would stop there, great. But it goes on. Anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable. What is that? Well, it's an Aramaic word that in Jesus' time would have been said something like this. Raka. Sorry, did, did I get any on you? <laughs> That's actually what it was intended to, to have that sound. Like, like I'm clearing my throat and spitting at you. I know that's graphic, but that's why Jesus puts it in there. He says, like, if that brother and sister do not stop this early and reconcile early and work through this together early, somebody's going to spit on the other person because that's just the logical next step. They condemn one another. So if anger is, I hope you hurt, this is, you don't have any value at all and you deserve to be hurt. See, that amps it up a little bit. And now Jesus is, like, I'm concerned that that's where we would go. Like, now you've driven over the first set of drift indicators. He goes on. He goes to this. He says, and anyone says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Okay. All right, Jesus. You're, like, <laughs> you're taking that way too serious. Like, you don't really mean that. Like, we say, like I said earlier, we use far more graphic terms than fool to say to one another, don't we? What's the deal with fool? This is what it meant to say, you fool, in Jesus' day. Not only did you not have value, but you were deserving of something really bad to happen to you. So I went from anger, where I want to hurt you, to condemnation, to, I hope, really rotten things happen in your life. You're so foolish. You're such a jerk. You're such a do-nothing, know-nothing. You get it? Right? And Jesus would say, no, no, that all started back here. Right here is where it started. How do, how do we know that? Because he finishes this section by giving us some remedies for how we could recognize and what we could do. And it's interesting where they both start. Here's the first thing that he says. He says, therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. That was such a serious thing to do. First, go and be reconciled to him. What's he saying? When those angry feelings start to rise, and you feel the rumble strips go off, and you can hear the drift indicators, stop and deal with it right there. You might have to go to the person. You might have to set up an appointment. You might have to do something. It doesn't mean they're right and you're wrong. It doesn't mean that. It means that I'm not going to let this go any further. I'm going to get it early. I'm going to get it quickly. I'm going to, as soon as I sense that, when I get the text, and texts should be banned from relationships. They really should be. Because texts are great for communicating. I'll be there at 7 o'clock or it's $3.81. They're terrible. 
They're destructive when it comes to sharing how I feel about you, how I think about you, what my sense of your value is. They're so easily misunderstood as our emails. What happened to us that we don't talk together anymore? The, the last two years have been tough on our relationships because we have lost the ability in our country to disagree with each other and still love one another and be in relationship with one another. We've lost that. And Jesus would say, not in my kingdom, but if you let that go, and two years later, you didn't stop something back here, the rumble strips were going off, and now you're over here, don't give up. It's a little bit more work to get back. You might need some help. You might need to pray for your own part in what has happened. But I want to bring you back. I want to reconcile. I want you to reconcile with each other. You know why? Because the most damaged relationship ever, irreconcilable differences, no way to put it back together again, zero chance, zero chance, was the relationship between human beings who walked away from a holy God and that holy God. Nothing could fix that. It was forever broken till God said, but I want to reconcile with them. I really do. I value them. I treasure them. They're important to me. So I'm going to go do it. I'm going to make the first move. While you were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Not once we got it together, not on our journey back to him, when we were still walking away, Jesus stepped in and goes, no more. I am now going to reconcile humanity to a holy God, and I'm the only one that can do it. I'm going to die in their place to pay the price of what they've done to walk away, and anybody who says yes to that, they're instantly reconciled to him. Do it early. That's why those kids getting baptized is so cool. Because they, they've, they've got that reconciliation early in life. And they get to walk with him their whole life. I said that earlier. So that's the first thing. I think Jesus would say, hey, do it early. Do it quick. Right? Reconcile over here. It's harder down there. And then he says this. He says, settle matters quickly with your adversary who's taking you to court. Do you know that that's not a moratorium on taking people to court? It's just not taking them to court when you're angry. It's, God's a God of fairness. God's a God who wants equity and justice. He does. He cares about marginalized. He cares about unfairness. He cares about that stuff, right? He invented the court system, by the way. It's just, he would say, don't do that with anger toward the person who you're in conflict with. In fact, once again, early on, before you go, try to settle over here. Because this can be a mandated settlement and you got to swallow it. Or what are the chances that if you, if you talk to them early, we don't even have to go there. Now, I'm not naive. Jesus is not naive. It doesn't always work that way, right? It doesn't. Sometimes our best intentions are spurned. I'm so sad over this. I have two relationships in my life that I have tried diligently to try to reconcile with the person. They believe I've done something wrong, and I, I very well may have. It, it wasn't intentional. I don't know precisely what it is that I did, but one of them for six years I have reached out over and over and over again, and I just get no response. One, two years ago, I just got a flat no, but I'm going to keep trying because I believe Jesus wants me to do that. I don't know how it'll work out, but that's not my responsibility. My responsibility is to be obedient to Jesus. Just in the last week or 10 days, I had a former colleague, uh, I was a colleague 15 years ago, come to town. He lives in another city. And uh, we went for lunch together, and we pulled back into the parking lot over here. 
And uh, he says, hey, I need to talk to you for a sec. I go, yeah, sure, what's up? He said, 15 years ago, I did something to you. I said something about you that wasn't true. And I, I really hurt you with that. And I just want to apologize to you for that. 15 years. Do you know I couldn't remember the incident? Long gone in my mind. But for 15 years. Oh, I wish he'd have come week one. And we could have, we could have been free from that. Right? This is Jesus pleading. Listen, listen, listen. Don't drift from me. Because when you drift, you lose sight of me and my values and how I live and what I'll do for you. And then you'll drift. I don't want you to drift. I don't want you to drift. Now, what do we do when the hurt is really, really difficult and it can't be undone? And it's left scars and it's left bruises and those really can't be changed and history really happened. And like, what do we do there? I know of no other way but to look at the cross of Jesus. Nobody in human history has been more abused, verbally demeaned, called raka and you fool than our Savior Jesus Christ. Nobody. Nobody. And he, he chose by his model and his life to show us how it could be done. And then here's the cool part. He says, if you trust me, I'll help you do that. I'll help you heal. I'll help you be restored. I'll help you forget that. I'll help you be new. I'll help you bring, and I'll help you, if it's right, to find a path back towards some form of reconciliation. This is how he does it. But apart from the cross of Jesus, I don't think we humans can do that. Now, it might take some help. It might take a trusted friend, a, a colleague, a pastor, somebody to help walk you through that. I think this is what Jesus is saying. And I think in his goodness, he looks back and he says, watch, watch, watch for the rumble strips. Watch for the drift indicators. Catch it early. Steer back into the lane with me. I'll walk you through this in a gracious way. Our God has built a beautiful kingdom and he invites us to live, it in, live in it with him, to walk with him in it, and to restore difficult relationships. We get to live without anger. Would you stand for closing prayer? Now, Jesus, for us human beings, this is tough subject matter because the likelihood is every one of us can think of a moment, even maybe this morning, where we were really quick to anger. And we said something to our spouse or we raised our voice to our children. Or maybe we got cut off in traffic or those things that happened to us. We're broken. And Jesus, we need your help. We really do. Thank you for being willing to do that. For steering us back into the lane. Thank you for those, those drift indicators. Would you help us listen to those this week? And steer back quickly. And then I, Jesus, I think like you are, I'm burdened for those who really have been hurt so badly. And anger just kind of simmers towards somebody else. And they've tried everything they've known to do to deal with it responsibly and carefully. They've maybe even tried to reconcile and just the door's been slammed on them. Jesus, would you give them courage and strength and peace of heart one more time, where they're hurt, would you heal? Where they're broken, would you restore? And Jesus, would you help us to do what you've asked us to do, to go early on and to be reconciled where we can? Thank you for your help, Jesus. We're really grateful for that. Amen. And now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance to you and flood you with his wonderful peace. Have a great week, everybody.